Hello, everybody. Good morning. I should say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you all for joining us from dif different parts of the country and indeed different parts of the planet. Uh, my name is Rodolfo Dirso, and I'm a professor in the biology department. Also, I'm a senior fellow of the Woods Institute for the Environment, and I have the enormous pleasure of serving as the AACDI, the Associate Chair for Diversity and Inclusion for EIPER. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, EIPER is the Emmet Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Brianna Sweety. And today, Brianna is doing her dissertation defense on the topic of changing land and people across the high divide, a land use transition analysis of the rural American West. We want to first start with our land <coughs> acknowledgements, excuse me. Brianna lives and works on the ancestral lands of the Soshone, Bannock, and Nez Perce tribes. She supports the sovereignty of these tribes for the indigenous individuals and communities who live there now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. She wants to offer gratitude and respect for these tribes and nations as the traditional stewards of the land, which is of great importance to these peoples. And I would like to share the statement that we use in my own laboratory. In recognition of the ancestral lands of the Muwegma Olone tribe, where our academic institution sits, we offer our grateful appreciation for the opportunity to live and work in their unceded lands. And we celebrate the culture and perseverance of the Mawegma Ohlone people and their strong identity. Now I want to make some quick and very important introductions. As part of Brianna's uh, examination committee, I am joined by her lead advisors, Dr. Eric Lamban, who is professor in Earth System Science and also a senior fellow of the Woods Institute for the Environment. Dr. Michelle Anderson, professor of law, and also senior fellow of the Woods Institute for the Environment, as well as the other members of the dissertation reading committee, including Dr. Lynn Hutzinger. She is professor of rangeland ecology and management and the Russell Rosticci chair in rangeland management at UC Berkeley. And also Dr. Bruce Kane, who is a professor of political science and the director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West also senior fellow of the Woods Institute for the Environment and the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and the Precourt Institute for Energy. I wanna say something really very quickly about the mechanics of the event today. So Brianna will do a presentation of her dissertation research after which members of the audience will get a chance to ask questions. And let me give you a little bit of a heads up that you might've seen at the beginning in a slide that was set up for you. Uh, the members of the audience uh, attending today may ask the question by typing them in the QA. And if you provide your names, I will invite you to please read your questions. Otherwise, I will read them out loud for the audience. And with that said, I want now to pass the microphone to Dr. Eric Lamban. Eric, please. Good morning, everyone. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Brianna Sweety. I first met Brianna 13 years ago when she was doing her master in Earth Systems at Stanford. Brianna then went to work at the Earth Innovation Institute, and there she was helping governments in Brazil and Peru to improve their land use policies. Then Brianna came back to Stanford, first with the idea of doing research in the Amazon, However, she quickly decided that the snowy ranch lands of Idaho were a much better fit for her. <laughs> During her PhD, Brianna has been also co-teaching a couple of field courses that were greatly appreciated by students. In a previous life, Brianna was a crop manager on a small organic farm in California. And now with her husband, they operate a vegetable farm in Idaho. That's a great way to do it mixing research with practice. Brianna, we look forward to hear the summary of your research and the screen is yours. 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm so excited to share this work with all of you. And, and thank you, Eric and Rodolfo, for that introduction. Today, I'm going to share my analysis of the land use transition of the American West, looking at how both land and people are changing across one region of the northern Rocky Mountains called the High Divide. The American West is in a lot of ways defined yesterday and today by dramatic environmental and social change. In some places, this is causing wholesale ecological change, including on rangelands, which are the focus of my research. These lands face increasing drought and extreme wildfire, conversion to the development, and invasive species and tree encroachment that are real puzzles for ranchers, land managers, and really anybody who cares about these landscapes. And there's often protracted conflict about how to solve these issues and adapt to change. In order to decipher these changes in the American West, you really need to consider history. Thinking on longer time scales can help us understand baselines, how the drivers of change might be shifting over time, and even illuminate some path dependence of past management meeting where past events might be constraining and shaping what the, look, the landscape looks like today. For instance, we had severe overgrazing at some points. We also had a history of cultural burning by indigenous people that intentionally set surface fires in the landscape, followed by a century of fire suppression by the Forest Service. So these past management impact what the landscape looks like. One thing that is clearly happening on, ranching, on rangelands today is a declining use of these lands for ranching. So this map here shows how grazing has changed on all Bureau of Land Management lands, that's in brown, and Forest Service lands in green. And the total amount of forage consumed by domestic livestock, which is measured in animal unit months, or AUMs, has declined by 15% over all these lands just in those 15 years, with extremes of up to 67% in some places. This change has an, an access to the public rangelands can be really significant for ranching economies, given the dominance of public land in the West. And that fact might seem unique to our situation in the American West, but really global rangelands are actually very often publicly owned and then collectively or privately used and managed. This creates multi-layered institutions that can be really rather complex to under the for understand the forces driving changes on rangelands. So really the motivating question for me when I started my work on this was to, to understand what is the fate of working lands in the rural American West? And as Eric mentioned, I moved to the rural American West during my PhD and my husband and I own and operate a vegetable farm in Bellevue, Idaho, which is really nearby my research locations. So I am part of the changes on working lands um, and that really motivates and guides my interest in doing this work. What I wanted to know in my dissertation research specifically was what are the drivers of multifaceted land use transition on rangelands and what do the impacts of and responses to that transition mean for the future of rural spaces and ecologies? What do I mean by a land use transition? It is a structural change in a land use system from one state to another. So in this case, it's one that is, was dominated by ranching to a landscape that's more dominated now by suburban and peri-urban development and amenity use like recreation. A land use transition analysis investigates the complex and interacting social ecological factors that drive land use. And it really tries to connect processes of rural change to land use and environmental change. And so all of my research on this took a place-based approach and focuses on one region of the Northern Rocky Mountains called the High Divide. This area gets its name because it traverses the Continental Divide and has the origins of both the Columbia and Missouri rivers. And the area is increasingly valued for being an important climate refuge and providing critical landscape connectivity. All of my work focuses on Idaho's portion of the High Divide and is centered on the Salmon Chalice and Sawtooth National Forests, which is highlighted in brown and green here. And in a lot of ways, the High Divide is the paradigmatic New West, 
We have these amazing wilderness areas that attract more and more urban people and recreationists, it's what the literature calls amenity migrants. And they're moving to resort towns that are growing faster than ever. But these changes are uneven, and a lot of towns actually have depressed rural economies in the high divide and have experienced rural brain drain. And overall, ranching is still the primary land use and happens predominantly on public lands. And ranching is still really felt to be an important part of the social fabric in a lot of places in the high divide. So my study of the land use transition has three parts and each corresponded to one chapter of my dissertation. The first, is, it looks at the drivers of the land use transition and is an analysis of the causes of changing grazing regimes on public lands. The second was interested in understanding what is the ecological impact of such a big land use transition, given that this is the removal or change of a rather large ecological disturbance in the form of grazing. So in particular, I assess the role of reduced livestock grazing on conifer encroachment into ranching. And third, I looked at one common community response to these changes which is a case of diverse actors coming together to solve conflicts on rangelands through collaboration for public land management. So jumping into part one, which again is an analysis of the proximate causes and underlying drivers of changing grazing regimes on public lands and was published in Global Environmental Change along with my co-author, Dr. Lambe. So my research question here is how and why has livestock grazing on public lands changed since 1940 in the high divide? The analysis focused on 90 grazing allotments on three districts of the salmon chalice and sawtooth national forests, which you can see here in yellow, red, and blue. And these allotments are the parcels of public lands that are grazed by permit to private ranchers. And to answer this question, I reviewed 80 years of old allotment files for the Forest Service Ranger District offices. These files are, they include everything from annual grazing agreements to the NEPA compliance documents, correspondence between ranchers and agency staff, and public comments. And these files are largely forgotten paper files stored in the old filing cabinets, basements, storerooms of the Ranger District offices. All in all, I reviewed over 11,000 documents. And that review allowed me to create a spatially explicit annual grazing land use history since 1940, which was in the form of a time series of annual animal unit months or annual forage consumed per allotment. I then used the full suite of documents to process trace the proximate causes of changes in grazing that are happening over time. Because agency staff are required to document all of their decision making, this was actually pretty apparent in the records. So what process tracing looked like is I would look first um, in the time series to identify when grazing had changed. So in the example I'll show, um, grazing had changed, there was a reduction of over 1200 AUMs on the Copper Basin allotment in the late 1980s. In a letter from the range manager to the district manager updating him about the state of this allotment, in particular, it had to do with a gentleman's agreement between ranchers about a fence and they were trying to solve that. But there was a reference here describing that the Copper Basin allotment was stocked at 60% capacity last year due to permittees taking non-use for personal convenience. This has been the case for several years. These permittees are in serious financial straits. So that allowed me to code this change in grazing as being driven by economics, mostly um, the permittee specifically reducing the size of their operation to, to it because of their financial situation. So overall, this analysis allowed me to identify that forage consumed by domestic livestock in this region declined by 62% since 1940. And this is the equivalent to tens of thousands fewer grazing animals on the landscape in the summer. And 21% of the area was closed to grazing. I think this sums it up from a rancher um, who said this to me, the biggest change in this valley is there's more people and less cows. So overall, I found that there were seven distinct proximate causes of grazing change. 
The bar graph here shows the contribution of each cause to the total change per decade. And the largest drivers of change that led to especially large reductions in grazing in the 40s and 50s were general range condition and the idea of carrying capacity. So the percentages here indicate the total contribution of that, team, of that change to the, uh, of that cause to change. Range condition can be thought of as the on the ground management by managers and ranchers to maintain ecosystem health and productivity, for instance, to prevent soil erosion. So this is probably what we think is happening as far as what range managers and agencies are doing. Um, the next, the next driver or cause was carrying the carrying capacity concept, which is when agency managers were trained to do vegetation studies that could identify the ideal number of cows or sheep that could graze a given piece of land or the carrying capacity. This was based on the popular ecological theory at the time, but has since really been debunked as not a great way to manage non equilibrium ecosystems. And then some other policy drivers started to come to, into play. And these were actually sometimes competing with each other. For instance, in 1960, Congress passed the Multiple Use and Sustained Yield Act. And the sustained yield portion of that meant that the Forest Service had to man manage for maintenance in perpetuity of a high level annual output. So in the 70s and 80s, the agency invested in range improvements, things like water developments to actually try to increase production of the landscape and thus they increased grazing, which is shown in the 70s and 80s in orange there on, on the figure. Then came along the legal and administrative requirements, specifically those coming from the National Environmental Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. These changes really had to do with complying with top-down policy and less to do with range managers' determination about how to manage lands. And they really led to reductions mostly in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And then we have um, economics, which was a driver of change throughout the study period. These changes are when a rancher decides to reduce the size of their operation, or maybe they changed, as an example that I showed earlier, um, or maybe they changed from sheep to cattle due to economics of the sheep industry. And given the fact that ranching is a really difficult business economically, these economic reasons were actually a much smaller cause than I would have anticipated. Although we did see a spike during the 80s in the farm crisis and also in the 2000s during the Great Recession. Next, we have amenity values and migration, which more recently has become a larger driver, but they are overall still relatively small. And this represents changes, maybe a reduction in grazing by a new amenity ranch owner that is more of a hobbyist or maybe permit reductions by agency staff that had to prioritize recreation over, a minute, or over grazing. I also found a small amount of reductions were due to wildlife values, specifically when range managers decided to reserve forage for wildlife. So if we group these five proximate causes together, they can all be thought of as the institutions of rangeland management. These are the policies, the science, the norms, and the values that define our relationship to rangelands. And they really drove the lion's share of changes in grazing on public lands. So this is in contrast to the socioeconomic changes that are often thought of as sort of external exogenous drivers, the economics of ranching or amenity migration that are indeed large drivers of rural change, but in this case, we're not large drivers of the land use transition. And consideration of these seven proximate causes allowed me to identify distinct phases of range management that each had distinct foci. And these shifting institutions drove change in grazing that slowly led to a widespread land use transition. What I wanna point out here is really this last phase called the, what I call the working wilderness. And in this phase, we observed a small, almost imperceptible increase in grazing it was really a result of increasing collaboration on the ground between ranchers and agency managers to try to conserve working lands and indicates that the recent shift toward collaborative approaches was indeed stabilizing the land use transition in this region. So in summary of this, this part, um, we quantified the land use transition and also quantified the proximate causes and underlying drivers of change over a really long time period, 
we found that shifting institutions of rangeland management rather than broader socioeconomic factors really drove change here. And we also showed that the land use transition was heavily guided by agency managers. There's a lot of work on working lands that really focuses on farmers and ranchers, and that makes sense. But we highlight that agency managers really have a very complex job that is important to the rural land use transition. And our research indicates that the fate of rangelands really depends on investing in these, in these actors and the institutions that guide them in order to reconcile the competing values and demands on these rangelands. Okay, so then moving into part two, I wanted to understand the ecological impact of the land use transition, specifically the role of reduced livestock grazing in driving conifer encroachment into rangelands. So let me define tree encroachment. It is the increasing abundance of trees or shrubs in places that were previously dominated by grasses. And while more trees might seem like a good thing, it's actually considered to be a major threat to global rangelands. So why might we care about tree encroachment? Um, it actually has uncertain and negative impacts on both ecosystem function of, um, of rangelands. It can change the hydrology. Trees use a lot of water. Um, it can change the carbon balance. Um, so while you get biomass stored in the trees above ground, you actually often lose soil carbon with more trees. And more trees change the fire regime such that the carbon you store is actually really likely to then burn up. Um, tree expansion also reduces forage quality and that's not just for livestock but also for wildlife. And finally, the process of tree expansion goes along with the overall homogenization of the landscape that tends to reduce biodiversity. A lot of species depend on rangeland habitats like mountain meadows for certain parts of their life cycle. And I just want to highlight that very often ecosystems are mosaics and there is a dynamic interplay over space and time between forest and grasses. So I don't want to say that trees are bad, that's certainly not the case, but that the mix of trees and rangelands is dynamic and understanding what drives those dynamics is important to inform management. So my research questions for this chapter were specifically, what is the rate of conifer cover change in Idaho's high divide landscape from 1955 to 2019? And how does changing grazing intensity impact the rate of conifer encroachment into rangelands? So how does grazing impact processes of conifer succession? There's a strong expectation that grazing acts as a disturbance, that it will inhibit encroachment through grazing and trampling of seedlings. And we've observed this at other places for sure, as for instance, in the European Alps. But grazing can also promote encroachment. Livestock can preferentially graze non-woody plants. They can also reduce the fine fuels. That means less fire and less burning of trees. <laughs> Livestock can also disperse conifer seeds in the landscape, as well as displace native browsers of conifer like elk or deer that might actually prefer to graze conifers more than their livestock do. And then of course, there are a lot of other factors over time. So in reality, there's a lot of uncertainty about how reducing grazing will impact conifer encroachment. The overview of my methods to answer these questions was to first map tree cover using historic and current imagery and then to use a natural experimental design that uses the variability in grazing change to understand the role of grazing and conifer encroachment. So um, we have a lot of old photos taken from airplanes that are this rich repository of historical data. And newer image analysis techniques allow us to make sense of these old images for research. I used a technique called object-based image analysis in order to classify every pixel of these photos into either tree or rangeland vegetation. And the appro approach here basically breaks up the images into objects that have similar color and does this at both large and small scales, and then uses that information of those objects, things like their standard deviation uh, of the brightness, their relationship to their neighbors, in a machine learning algorithm that then classifies the objects into tree or non-tree 
In this case, I used random, a random forest classifier that used samples that me and a research assistant generated through visual interpretation of the photos. So we did this both for old imagery and for the current satellite imagery, and the end result are these nice and very accurate maps of tree cover and range vet land vegetation in both time periods. So here are the maps, um, which amount to um, a data source that is at a higher resolution and over a longer time period than any existing data. And the overall result we found was that there was a 21% increase in conifer cover and a 7% loss, mostly due to fire. And that means that there is an overall net change, um, net increase of 13% in conifer cover since 1955. So then I was able to use a natural experimental approach, as I mentioned, to understand the role of grazing in that process of conifer cover dynamics. I use the fact that there was a variability in the changes in grazing at the allotment scale in the data that I made from chapter one, and also variability in the changes in conifer cover at the allotment scale to test the role of grazing here. My statistical approach was um, one of a linear multivariate regression um, with controls that, con that control for key biophysical covariates, those that are shown here in the table, um, past wildfires, climate and climate change variables, topography and grazing. And here are the results of that analysis. This is a graph of the standardized coefficients of the different variables that we tested. So we can compare the size of their effect on either promoting or inhibiting um, conifer. At the top here are the grazing variables. Our analysis showed that changes in grazing overall are really not a large driver of vegetation changes. Reduction in grazing did not correlate to the rate of conifer cover change. And this result was um, robust to all our different model formulations here, including a matched analysis. The matched, in the matched analysis, we compare the allotments that are most similar to one another as, as far as the important variables like topography and climate to reduce the amount of bias in this observational analysis and make it more like an experiment with a treatment and a control group. The one grazing variable that we did um, see had a small positive but very significant impact on increasing conifer encroachment was the change from sheep to cattle between 40, 70 years ago when some ranchers changed grazing animals because of a downturn in the sheep industry. And this effect on in promoting tree cover of changing from sheep to cattle makes sense given what we know about the difference between sheep and grazing, sheep and cattle grazing behavior in the landscape. And then our result confirms what might feel very visible right now with all the wildfires, but fire really drove conifer cover change in our analysis. Specifically, older fires that burned between 1984 and 1999 promoted conifer cover increase. And that was actually promoting forest expansion, not just regeneration, showing that fire is really paving the way for vegetation movement in the landscape. And less surprisingly, we found that more recent fires that burned between 2000 and 2009 decreased tree cover. So overall, um, the results of this analysis showed that despite losses, conifer cover expanded since 1955. Fire, not livestock grazing, is driving conifer encroachment. And the results suggest overall that vegetation is really resilient to long-term grazing and highlights, I think, that the fact that grazing in often, is often a very low impact land use in the landscape. But I also do want to say that we should avoid unrealistic or oversimplistic views of the impact of grazing on these lands, either positive or negative. There's a lot of talk among ranchers and managers that removing grazing will lead to, to invasion of trees and shrubs. And that result was not really borne out in our research in this place particularly. And of course, it's important to keep in mind that this is just one ecological impact of many other possible impacts of removing, removing grazing. Okay, so transitioning to the part three, um, I wanted to understand here, what is the social response to the land use transition? And I did this specifically by looking at how diverse groups are coming together to try to collaborate, to try to 
solve conflict related to public land management. So this type of collaboration is really the new norm of natural resource governance. And there has been a proliferation of collaborative, multi-stakeholder and participatory approaches and in a lot of ways, there is good reason for that. We know that good collaboration can lead to positive things like solving conflict, overcoming um, past, past issues, supporting social learning, being more de democratic, more efficient and effective than top-down approaches. But we also know that collaborative processes are time and resource intensive, and that's a real thing. <laughs> And they can actually lead to lower quality strategies sometimes. So there is an increasingly calls for understanding in what cases and contexts collaboration is really the best approach. One element that we have to think about is that current political culture is increasingly characterized by affective polarization. What that means is it's the extent to which individuals dislike members of another group or another political affiliation. And so this is a real dislike rather than just a difference of opinion. And you can imagine that might really impact diverse groups ability to come together. Here's the state of the art conceptual framework of collaborative governance that's often used to understand how these processes work. Much is known from this type of research about how to design collaborative processes and there's been a heavy focus of research on the inner ring here of collaboration dynamics. The idea being if you invest in creating principled engagement among participants, shared motivation and joint capacity, then you have a higher likelihood of success. And that is where a lot of the best practices of how to collaborate have come from. But I want to note that there's a lot less understanding about how system contexts, the outer ring in gray, impacts collaboration processes as they unfold and vice versa. And the political polarization that I was talking about really puts collaboration under pressure as a, collab uh, as a contextual variable. And in the high divide, there is indeed a context of polarization. Political identity really does impact views about land management. And that is for good reason. There has been a loss of the traditional extractive industries, like in grazing I showed in chapter one. And in its place, there's more and more conservation and wilderness with a capital W than ever. Amenity migrants are raising land values and climate stress puts more and more pressure on people. So there's division here, not just about extractive use, not just about liberal versus Republican, but a lot of anxiety overall about inclusion in the future of the rural American West. So my research questions here were how can a collaborative governance process work in a polarized political context? And what elements of the process impact outcomes? The case I used to study this was the Central Idaho Public Lands Collaborative, which is a multi-stakeholder group to develop, to develop consensus proposals to in inform forest service planning on the Sam and Chalice National Forest. What is at stake here with these planning processes is the Forest Service is setting the overall management direction for the forest, and it, it can be for up to 30 years. And it's kind of like this giant zoning exercise, and it really matters for what's going to happen on these lands. The collaborative group here was independent of the Forest Service, and they included over 50 diverse participants at their outset including hunters and mountain bikers, environmental NGOs and ranchers. And they really tried to engage all the possible different groups and affiliations that had an interest in this forest. The group was facilitated by a local NGO that had a past history of success at collaborating related to public lands. And I just wanna mention briefly that the local native tribes did not participate in the collaborative as they choose to engage independently with the Forest Service. And so this collaborative was a great idea, sounds really nice. Um, but as I mentioned, this is a context of really difficult polarization pu about public lands. So soon after the collaborative group started their work, another group, the Grassroots Advisory, formed to also work on forest planning. 
This group was not a collaborative, but rather a group of politically aligned stakeholders with connections to the Idaho Tea Party. They formed after a Forest Service meeting when a group of citizens was repeatedly interrupting the Forest Service staff, expressing a lot of frustration, a lot of anger. And the agency manager tried to calm the crowd and said, we don't have to act like a bunch of angry villagers. So that phrase actually became a rallying cry for this group about how the Forest Service related to the local community, so much so that people were putting these bumper stickers on their cars with angry villager. Um, and so the formation of the grassroots advisory reflected this polarized context, but also really changed the setting in which the collaborative group was trying to operate. My methods to understand this pretty messy process were to use a single case study, which really allowed for attention to rich contextual information. I selected the case at its outset, which avoided some limitations of past case study research on collaboration, which have largely focused on successful cases kind of post facto. I observed over 75 hours of group meetings from November 2017 to February 2021, basically from the start to the finish of the process. And I reviewed all the relevant documents and outputs of the group. I also conducted 19 semi-structured interviews with collaborative participants, with grassroots advisory members and forest service staff. Here's the timeline of how the collaborative and the broader planning process unfolded. So after formation, the collaborative did as they intended to do. They followed along the Forest Service process and created some really exciting consensus proposals that people were really pretty proud of. But by 2019, the grassroots advisory managed to get the ear of the Forest Service at the national level, which was now led by sympathetic Trump administration appointees. So the complaints of the grassroots advisory really focused here on lack of meaningful community involvement in the, in the planning process and the collaborative. After some deliberation, the Forest Service ultimately decided to halt the planning process last year, feeling that they were not going to be able to come to a socially desirable plan, which is their goal. So this was essentially a derailment of the process by the grassroots advisory. After all this happened, one collaborative member reflected to me, I learned there's a lot of justified anger. However, the way the grassroots advisory were going about it was because they were in power. So one could view this outcome of the derailed process as due to purely external politics shifting power dynamics. And as a result, there's not much that the collaborative could have done here to change the outcome. But another collaborative member reflected to me, the success of the collaborative is what brought forward the grassroots advisory. So in reality, the grassroots advisory arose both out of the shifting political context and through interactions with the collaborative and the Forest Service. My analysis showed that the collaborative largely followed best practices and they created desired healthy collaboration dynamics internally that led to an internally successful process. But these best practices did not necessarily respond well to a polarized context. So our analysis allowed us to identify four process, uh, collaboration design trade-offs that are particularly relevant for polarized context. And due to time, I'm just gonna talk about two of these trade-offs today. There was really a trade-off in this group between the formality and the inclusivity of the structure of the group. With it, this group was really highly formalized as you can see from this figure. They even created a voting member table that was made up of representative, representatives of different segments of society. And that was the intention there was to create balanced participation from different groups and make sure no group sort of took the process over, like no environmental groups, for instance. But that ended up creating feelings of exclusivity. One member that participated in both the collaborative group and the grassroots group reflected when I was told I would not be allowed to vote, there was no, and there was nobody representing my interest, that was a chink in the armor as far as representing a full collaborative. The next trade-off I identified was related to balanced representation, 
and whether the group was able to represent the full community that it was intended to try to represent, or if it was more of a group of people that had a strong mutual interest in collaboration specifically. Over time, participation in this group did end up skewing more and more toward environmental groups, not necessarily in like who was on the list of participants, but who was really active in the meetings. And it, it really showed that the environmental groups were highly motivated to participate in collaboration. One staff from an, a conservation organization shared with me, there's enough energy out there that links us to conspiracy theories that we realize if it's endorsed by a collaborative, it's a lot stronger than if it's coming from one group alone. So this strong participation from conservation groups at the outset, the strong motivation to be there, actually made it harder for this group to really meaningfully engage other types of actors. Another collaborative member reflected to me, a lot of the locals felt very pressured or left out because there were so many nationally recognized powerhouse NGOs involved. And I think that they really felt threatened by that. So the collaborative group did over time become more of this kind of coalition of groups that had this mutual interest in collaborating rather than broadly representative of the community and all the different identities that make that up that they were hoping to from their outset. So in reflection, the overarching contributions of this chapter are that increasing pol political polarization is likely to increase contestations of collaborative processes. And I identified design trade-offs for these types of collaboratives that, to consider and that are really important in polarized context. I showed that an overly structured collaborative affects um, and can compromise inclusivity in the group. And polarization might actually necessitate a shift back to more little C collaboration that is more informal and self-initiated and kind of the origins of these type of collaborative governments. Initiating leadership also in this case, um, which was both the facilitator who had already pre prior relationships with the Forest Service and other NGOs, and also this really strong initial interest from environmental groups, limited balanced representation over time, which really undermined the ability of this group to work and be effective in a polarized context. So in conclusion, overall, my research in the high divide allowed me to investigate the future of working lands in a context of global environmental change. I hope it demonstrates the necessity of thinking about the social and ecological processes and their feedback simultaneously and over time. And some of the contributions of the individual parts that I wanna highlight now are institutions and the values that they reflect drive land use transitions on rangeland. And rangeland vegetation overall is relatively resilient to grazing over very long time periods, but also Business as usual grazing won't necessarily guarantee benefits of working land, especially moving forward into novel ecosystems. Also, collaborative governance approaches for natural resources and working lands cannot be one size fits all and really must be context sensitive. And when I step back and reflect on the future of working lands based on all this research, I really want to emphasize that land use transitions are not uniform and rangelands do not have a homogenous response. One really needs to look at the unique ecology and the social change in the place to understand impacts. And I also wanna emphasize that these changes are not necessarily positive or negative, although we have a strong urge to try to classify them that way, but we are living in emergent rural ecologies that will continue to change on us. And our values will define how we manage these novel ecosystems. And that can really impact what the landscape's gonna look like in the future. All along the way, I, I know there's gonna be opportunities for conflict and for collaboration and our governing approaches can make a difference in what is more prevalent. So finally, I do hope that this work will provide a basis for future research. The land use transition is definitely ongoing, so there needs to be continued work to understand the ongoing impacts of rural migration, for instance, that driven by the COVID-19 pa pandemic, 
um, and also climate change on, on the rangeland use transition. And I also think we need to continue to interrogate the role and value of working landscapes in novel rural ecosystems. And to do that critically, including like, do these working landscapes support rural prosperity maybe in comparison to recreation economies? Or by, are, are they really gonna provide natural climate solutions for us? My research also supports past observation that ranchers are really, really committed to being on the land and to the ranching um, way of life. And so I do think that that can be viewed as an opportunity. I'm particularly very excited about work that engages ranchers as novel ecosystem stewards, using targeted grazing for vegetation management and fire risk. But this does require new ways of thinking about ranch economies and including our institutions of public land that are really gonna determine whether this can be feasible. So that's all I have today. Thank you everybody for listening in. We're now gonna have some time for discussion and questions. Wonderful, Rihanna. Thank you so very much for um, this lovely, challenging and exciting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned before, I will now invite members of the audience to uh, participate in the Q&A and send questions and comments uh, to Brianna. And um, as I mentioned before, you um, can ask your questions in the Q&A box uh, in your screen. Uh, and I will be more than happy to uh, give you the microphone. And um, otherwise, I can read your questions. So. Please go ahead and um, participate with us with Q and A. I do not see any questions right now, Brianna, and I don't know if anybody else can see any questions. Um, and, but I want to uh, start by saying that was a terrific presentation, Brianna. Can I uh, start perhaps by asking you a very ecological question uh, uh, that I would like uh, to learn a little bit more about? What um, what are the reasons behind uh, these uh, thing that you mentioned about the carrying capacity that is a very popular and appreciated aspect of the ecology in terms of population ecology and things like that was debunked and, and not uh, continued to be used as a, as a criterion to assess the situation, the ecological situation? Yeah, thank you, Rodala. Thanks for that question. Um, so carrying capacity really had to do, um, it, it, was, it was driven by ecological studies that were happening in the Midwest in the, um, on the prairie landscape and had to do mostly with sort of forest and rangeland vegetation there. Um, and they were, and it was in a lot of ways, it was sort of a convenient um, theory for managers because the idea was, oh, you could find this really specific carrying capacity and that would allow to, us to support this kind of controlled management over time. But what happened was over time, there's been a, a much greater appreciation for the fact that many, many rangeland ecosystems are, especially those that are more arid and have a higher variability in the precipitation every year, mm -hmm. are not really equilibrium landscapes um, mm -hmm. and not really driven by this type of succession ecology. They're more mm -hmm. driven by non-equilibrium dynamics of like whatever rainfall happens that year is gonna really determine what the landscape looks like. So over time, it's become more and more debunked, especially like the first kind of attention to that happened in the 80s and then in the 90s. And still today, it, that difference um, has not necessarily fully infiltrated like the, the agency management forest service. They're still, still stuck on some of that old old style of management, but um, there is much greater appreciation for the non-equilibrium type yeah. of dynamics here. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Yes. We have two more questions coming up. One is by Kelly Sweety, Sweety and I think there might be some uh, genetic relationship there. So Kelly, can you go ahead and ask your question? The question is, what is the impact of conifer expansion and grazing on biodiversity. Wonderful. Yeah, so um, that's really fundamental here. And it's really two different questions. Um, conifer encroachment 
can have a negative impact on biodiversity in a lot of places. Um, for instance, the, the sage grouse, which is one of the keystone species of the Great Basin, there's been find that just like an increase of a few percent in conifer and cover can completely make it um, an uninhabitable area for sage grouse because um, predator birds use those trees as like to hunt from and will hunt their nests. So um, that's been a change. There's also been a lot of work from Lynn Hunsinger, who's on my committee in, in, um, in California, showing how different parts of the grazing system actually promote um, biodiversity, like the, um, the, the grazing ponds that are used for watering kind of act as vernal pools in the landscape and can support different salamander species. So it really is not such an easy question to answer. And that's why I really emphasize that we have to look at um, the site specifics here to understand the relationship between both conifer encroachment and grazing on biodiversity. Thank you, Kelly. I'm sure that a lot of people had a similar question. Thanks a lot. Um, we have Alexandria and then Carly. Uh, Alexandria, please go ahead. Hi, Brianna. This is amazing. Thank you very much for presenting on these issues and all of the work that you did. Um, my question for you, I'm just curious, where, what are the areas for further development in your research? Like, is there anything that you want to dig into further following what you've done here so far? Thanks, Alex. Thanks for that question. Um, yes, I'm, I, I mentioned this in my conclusion. I'm, I'm really excited about the prospect of prescriptive grazing or targeted grazing um, to help us sort of adapt to novel ecosystems. Um, this has sort of happened organically in California with goat grazing to try to change the vegetation to prevent fire risk. And that's sort of been this organic thing that has happened over time that that has developed and, and there's a lot of potential more broadly to use the fact that these ranchers and these people are on the landscape and adapt what they're doing to help us adapt to, to environmental change. So I'm, I, I um, hopefully will be doing some work on that with Kelly Hopping, who I hope is on the call as well. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's the area that I'm, I'm most excited about right now. Thank you, Alexandria. Kelly, can you go ahead and ask your question about tribes? Hello, thank you, Brianna. Uh, excellent presentation. I'm, I'm a first year student and am looking up to you as I Aww. figure out what to study. <laughs> as you mentioned that the tribes have their own channels to communicate with the US Forest Service, but since you spent so much time here, I'm wondering if you have a sense of whether tribal priorities converge or diverge from the priorities of the other occupants in this space um, and, and how you think about those. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful question, Carly. I mean, I'm so excited that you're part of EIPERT. Um, and it's a complicated question. I think I first want to say that there, in this region, and this is not the case everywhere, there are real capacity limitations for the, the local tribes to engage in this policy process, which I think really needs to be addressed and, um, and supported. And as far as their, whether their interests diverge or converge, I think there's probably a, a lot of both here. Um, I think in a lot of ways the, the tribes are interested in, in, in active management, returning fire to the landscape, for instance. Um, and that sometimes actually goes against their, what you would might think is their allies and conservation groups, which some of the conservation groups really have a sort of wilderness approach here that we should still be kind of hands off. And so um, I wouldn't say that that it's necessarily predictable of like who's allies with the, the, the native tribes. Um, and the one thing I just think is that that I hope that their engagement can be really supported at the from the Forest Service. So I don't necessarily think that you know, their ability to engage in this collaborative makes sense um, and is and they have a whole other sort of power and political stance. Um, that they can um, use. And um, so it's really at the forest service level that I think the onus is on them to be able to engage these groups. Thank you, Carly. Um, uh, as you could have predicted, Brianna, you have a lot of questions and I don't think that we're gonna have time to, uh, for you to address those, but let me ask uh, John to ask his carbon related question. John Byrne, please go ahead. 
Hi, Brianna. A great presentation. I have a question about um, carbon sequestration. You mentioned that in the region you studied, conifer expansion actually may not uh, sequester more carbon than keeping existing rangelands. I found that just like intuitively hard to believe. So I'm just curious if your research uh, looked at that, uh, tried to quantify that, or you can speak to research in that area that tries to quantify that. Yeah, um, so my research doesn't quantify it specifically. Um, it just wasn't the focus here, but we can, I think that the larger point is that the, the carbon stored in forests is actually not very stable. And there's more and more work that's addressing this in the American West and in the Sierra Nevada, um, where we've had this expansion of trees, like the thicketization of the forest, it's more dense. And so there might be more above ground carbon, but it's very, very likely to burn up. And the more catastrophic the wildfire is, the more likely that we'll lose all of the carbon rather than the traditional surface fires that um, more had a carbon cycling effect here. So um, yeah, I can't speak to the fact that um, whether there's more or less carbon because I really didn't measure that here, um, but we do know that the general dynamics that are indicative of this. And, I, and Lynn Hunsinger also um, on my committee has been analyzing and talking about this fact in, in California as a um, the changes in sort of the firescape and related to grazing. Thank you, Young. Um, um, there's a lot of questions really, Brianna, um, but I'm gonna give the last one, unfortunately, because of uh, time constraints to Garrett. I think this is a big question, Brianna, so you might want to see if you can address it in a relatively short time. So okay. Garrett, please go ahead. Okay. So the question Garrett had, uh, first of all, uh, uh, wonderful to see another cohort make, uh, make it to this milestone. And then the question is, um, tell us more about how your various chapters on, on the thesis with different methodological approaches speak to one another. And I told you it's a, kind of a big question, so you can- Yeah, somehow. thanks Garrett, thanks for that. Um, well, I just, I hope some of my conclusions on this reflect on this, but you know, I, I was able to, for instance, use this grazing data to understand um, conifer encroachment. So it required this um, really kind of like deep historical analysis and digging into these documents in order for us to ask sort of a current ecological question, which is sort of an unusual data source there. And then I think for instance, um, simultaneously, looking at the social dynamics and um, being very attuned to the um, different groups and their different interests allowed me to even see, you know, this question of ecology and conifer encroachment in a different way and understand what's at stake for people here, what's driving their perceptions about what the landscape look like and why we might even be considering it a problem or not um, and who it's a problem for. So I think, um, the, the, the ability and the, the luxury that EIPER affords of me being able to do this super interdisciplinary work, which is sometimes kind of cumbersome and, and um, takes a long time, but um, it does sort of change our perception of what are the important questions um, and what are the different possible ways that we could ask them in, in ways that might not be traditional in a, in a discipline. Thank you, Brianna. And um, um, I wanna thank everybody again for your questions and for participating today. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much more time to do that, more time to do that, but I want to uh, also mention to you that please look for an email later. Uh, this is going to be an email from ITRAN, who is the Assistant Director of Student Services, who is going to be announcing the results of this uh, 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 defense. And now I would like to give you some minutes, uh, Brianna, for you to make your uh, acknowledgements, please. Thank you, Rodolfo, um, and thank you everyone again. Um, I have so many people to thank that have supported me and my work throughout this process. I, of course, need to thank the countless people in the High Divide that were the center of my research. So many people welcomed me into their homes. They shared their stories with incredible generosity, and I'm just very, very appreciative. I especially want to thank Faith Ryan, at the, um, who was at the Forest Service when I was doing this work, and also Tony Ruth and Mindy Crowell, who each were really integral to making my research possible in Idaho. I also need to thank my amazing committee, and I, I deeply admire each of these folks. Um, Rodolfo Dierso, I have known since I was an undergrad as well, and it is really special to me to have you facilitate today. 
Pleasure. And thank you. And Eric Lambin, um, he is my lead advisor and he absolutely shepherded me through this process with so much care and attention. Um, Eric always, is, always manages to ask the very central questions that um, made my work more rigorous and also more meaningful. Eric also runs the Land Change Lab at Stanford, which has been my academic home there. Um, Eric just manages to bring such a fantastic um, group of people together, and this lab has been such a source of camaraderie through my PhD. I also want to thank Michelle Anderson, who agreed to be part of my committee coming from the law school just as I started my PhD, and it was always just meant so much to me that she was coming from this whole other part of campus, but nonetheless was willing to be on my advising team. And I've so appreciated all of her reflections on what mattered about my research for society more broadly and questions of justice, and have really benefited from her mentorship. And then Lynn Hunsinger. Um, Lynn Hunsinger was so welcoming to me when I showed up at her Rangelands class in Berkeley. And Lynn, you really made me feel like I could contribute to Rangelands research, even though I was coming from Stanford that didn't have a real big history of work on this. But you have made such a big impact on my scholarly direction. And I need to thank Bruce Kane, who runs the Bill Lane Center for the American West. Bruce has really generously included me at happenings at the Bill Lane Center. And he's also supported my work with a research assistant. I am so thankful to you, Bruce, for your laser focus on why my research matters for the American West. And then I'd also like to thank e everybody at EIPER, um, all the staff, and marie Sue, Gabby, I, you've all helped so gracefully with logistics all along the way. Um, and I've also learned a lot from the general student community at EIPER. I really especially want to thank my cohort. You guys, you are just, I've made some really wonderful friendships in this group. And um, I'm just so inspired by each of you and the work that you do and I'm excited about what you're all doing now and next. And I must also thank my wonderful research assistant, Sheila Cochran, who helped me get through some really arduous data processing for chapter two. And Sheila, you're just such a pleasure to work with, so thank you. And then finally, of course, I want to very heartily thank those whose financial contributions made this research possible, the Woods Institute, as well as the Landreth, Goldman, and Emmett families. I, I see the impact of these families' commitment to sustainability at Stanford every day. And so I'm so thankful that you guys are investing in my and others' work. And then I do just want to quickly thank my family and many friends who have supported me in so many different ways and the many who are on the call. Um, my parents have always encouraged me to do something that I care about. My dad always added it, it should probably be something that might just make a difference. And my mom has always just been a fierce advocate for me, always looking out for my well-being when I might not be. <laughs> And I also really need to thank Judy Fox and Ellie Polk. And um, these two have lovingly cared for my son over the last year so that I could finish this work. Dimitri, my son is a rabble rousing little toddler, um, but I thank him nonetheless for being such an immense source of joy. And I finally wanna thank my husband, Simon. He has supported me in so many ways, um, but his shared appreciation and interest in this landscape has made my research process so much richer. Okay, everybody, that's all I have. Um, I'm just very, very thankful for you all to be here um, and share this work. And I'll just mention that because I'm not on campus, we can't have a reception, but I um, do hope that I'll be able to see you all in person at different places around the globe at one point soon. So thanks so much. And if you're ever in Idaho, let me know. <laughs> all right. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. We'll see you in an hour and yes. the rest of the committee as well. I might be one nanosecond late because I'm running another event right now. Yes, no worries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.